Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon and a welcome to all the participants and our worthy speakers for today's session. That is Tech for Global Tech Market, the East West Infinity Story, Vision for Pakistan's Technology Cluster. And we have with us a very renowned Dr. Harun Javed Qureshi, who is the founder of East West Infinity and is also the president of Pakistan Aerospace Council. Dr. Harun Javed Qureshi, PhD, is a passionate electronic engineer by education and profession hailing from a military family. He has a daughter and two sons, fortunately, all engineers by his choice, uh, by uh, them, their choice. And uh, his uh, beloved wife, uh, she passed away some time back, but uh, he is an ardent experimenter, uh, an amateur radio, a radio operator, plays music and is fond of reading. Uh, he has a technology focus and diversified 43 years of experience of engineering, technical management, and entrepreneurial experience in diverse field in professional and defense electronic technologies. 38 years as a founder, hands-on CEO of the companies that he founded. He has been often involved in the cutting edge technologies, segment leadership and entrepreneurship, and is also the member of professional bodies, IEEE and AIIA, and uh, a PAC professional engineer also. Uh, this uh, uh, this uh, complete uh, uh, introduction is the representation of Dr. Harun Javed Qureshi is also the uh, CEO of uh, EWI, which is uh, East West Infinity, which is a family owned high tech company founded by US educated engineers, which is focused to bridge the technology gap between East and West. So now after 38 years, it has transitioned to the next generation of the engineers in the family. It is a technology centric establishment with technical skills and technology infrastructure located in a self owned 2,800 square kilometer industrial facility. They have a domestic and international customer base and their entire business model revolves around knowledge, know-how and do-how. Electronics created centered uh, technology business. Uh, our today's webinar is in collaboration uh, with the AIIA, Asian Institute of Industrial Air and Pakistan Aerospace Council, PAEC. Uh, before we proceed, I would like to have mentioned that uh, Asian Institute of Industrial Air, it is the only institute in Pakistan that's offering advanced level of certified training courses uh, in the domain of industrial air engineering, automation production, engineering, as well as media and arts. So AIA, it identifies and addresses the need of the industry, as well as the industry professionals to upgrade their skills uh, pertaining to the industrial requirement. So uh, AIA, they're offering training solutions for different levels, and that include the training for the industrial professionals, and uh, that includes uh, training for, for early and mid-career level individuals, which is according to the current industry demand. Uh, they're also offering training to the fresh graduates, which is providing fresh graduates with the opportunity to build a skill set relevant to the market needs. And also they're offering customized trainings, which is uh, offering need-based training, uh, customized trainings for the industries to get the most out of their workforce. So apart from this, uh, opportunities are available for the professionals to use their skills as trainer and resource person by sharing their experience and expertise. Uh, the co-host of uh, uh, today's session is Pakistan Aerospace Council, uh, which is a cluster organization for the enterprise active in the aerospace, defense, and high-tech electronics market. It is formed uh, for the global promotion of the high value addition and uh, high technology manufacturers of Pakistan while meeting the national needs of the technology acquisition as well as the export-led sustainable growth of Pakistani aerospace industries. PAC, Pakistan Aerospace Council, it supports the development of the aviation and the related technology. Uh, it improves the visibility of Pakistani aerospace industry globally, and it's aiming for a growing market share. Uh, it aims to cater the members' interest on a political level and facilitates networking between the members. It develops uh, business opportunities by organizing attendance to major business events and aim at a uh, well-functioning triple helix structure. Pakistan Aerospace Council platform can uh, help in building technology roadmap for future, inshallah. And uh, with the, along with Dr. Harun uh, Qureshi, we have uh, our panelists for today's session as well, Dr. Arshad Ali. 
Uh, he is the co-convener Pakistan Aerospace Council and the CEO of Asian Institute of Industrial Air, uh, AIIA. And uh, Dr. Arshid, he is basically the recipient of Sitara Mtaz and private performance from the government of Pakistan. He completed his PhD from United States of America and has served as the executive director of Higher Education Commission, HEC Pakistan. He has been the vice chancellor of National Textiles University, Faisalabad, Dean, Nast Islamabad and Pakistan Airports. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that there are going to be a lot of questions from your side regarding today's uh, session and regarding uh, Dr. Haroon's uh, live. So I will request all the participants to drop their questions in the chat box and we will try. Dr. Ashad is going to moderate the question and answer session and we're going to try that we answer most of it. Uh, please uh, keep your questions very limited, very precise, and I hope that we're going to answer it towards the end of our presentation. So Dr. Saab, uh, welcome on board and uh, now now I hand it over to you as well. Thank you, Bakhtawar. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shahli sadri wa yafqli amli wa hukul min lisani wa yafqahu kali. Prayer from uh, our uh, Hazrat Musa, which uh, speaks about uh, making his speech well understood. I pray the same. So let's see <clears throat> what happened here. Yeah, okay, here we go. So technology for the global technology market is the theme of the talk today. And uh, this evolves out of East-West infinity story and a vision for Pakistan's technological cluster under the umbrella of EAEC. I am Dr. Harun Javed Qureshi. I'm the founder of East West Infinity and the president of uh, Pakistan Aerospace Council. In fact, uh, uh, today's talk is a, a kind of a personal story uh, and the, the story of my company. And I do not know where the personal story stops and the company story starts because essentially at the end of the day, both of us um, start and stop at the same place. I thank Pakistan Aerospace Council and the uh, Asian Institute for Industry Air for affording me the platform and the opportunity to speak to you today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for taking the time to come and join us. I hope uh, you will take away something from uh, my life journey after I'm through. Best way to describe my destiny and my life journey is uh, Lama Iqbal's uh, saying, what could fit me more than this? I do not know if Allah destined it for me or was it my passion that Allah answered that my life story is exactly what I wanted it to be and I cannot be more grateful to Allah than this. The translation for those people who um, cannot uh, uh, read English very well. So I start. All right, so um, sir, I would actually want to know about the academic background that you had and what pro prompted you to start an electronic business. And can you please share your initial journey as well? Thank you, Bakhtavar. My interest in electronics started somewhere in 1965. I was about 10 years old at the time. Um, started with the discovery of a mystery box that my dad had bought back with him from United States of America where he, he had gone as a military officer in 1955 for a training course. This was a box of surplus electronics and there was a book inside that box which read Amateur Radio Handbook. And um, I could not just understand a word of that because I was 10, 10 years old, but somehow looking at all the circuits, the bells started ringing, the bells of my passion started ringing. Uh, academics, um, since dad was in the military, so five, six uh, cantonment schools uh, where um, I was educated. In fact, honestly speaking, I would not be able to remember more than one or two of them. And finally, I landed up for my ninth and the 10th class at a PAF run school, uh, what is now called the Rafiki Bay, short court. And then finally to Gordon College, Rawalpindi, where I finished my college. And um, off I went to um, University of Engineering Technology, Lahore, 
for my bachelor's in electronic engineering. Uh, this was, I started in 1971 uh, in UET Lahore. And then uh, thereafter, I, after I finished and had worked for a little while in Pakistan, I got the opportunity to go to the Silicon Valley to do my master's in electronic engineering as well. And uh, along with that, the opportunity to work a little. And the PhD came much later because my yearning for uh, knowledge never ended. It's not ended today. I'm, I'm still a student. So after I came back to Pakistan, um, after five years of jobs in Pakistan and uh, USA, um, return to Pakistan was primarily because my dad was retiring from the armed forces in 1981. And I figured that out of the siblings, one of us has to be in Pakistan for whatever reason. As I said, I don't know if that this was my destiny or um, uh, this is what I really wanted. But after returning to Pakistan, um, the job uh, prospects were very bleak. There were only three organizations which had any opportunities for electronic engineers. The Telephone and Telegraph, what, what is known as uh, PTCL today and uh, uh, NTC today, Pakistan Broadcasting Corporation, Radio Pakistan, and PTV. These were fine institutions. However, uh, from my perspective, they were, these were babu-making institutions where they'd uh, make uh, turn engineers into paper pushers. And that was not my piece of cake. And returning to the US also did not really appeal to me as a career destination for whatever reason. Um, I was um, hardly um, 20 some years old then. And I'm surprised that my destiny did not allow me to take the wrong decisions at that stage, at least from my perspective. So now 38 years of technology centered journey may have uh, some takeaways uh, for the entrepreneurs, for the businesses out there, about the do's and don'ts, and the lessons that um, I learned along uh, my journey, and some lessons for the policy makers for the inclusiveness of the private sector, if it really matters. Policy makers, because they, have, they may have missed some uh, landmarks of uh, uh, making the private industry inclusive in, uh, in, their, uh, in, 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 the, in the destiny of Pakistan. I'll break down my entrepreneurial journey into four segments. Uh, the first from 1982 to 87, about five years, then 87 to 2000, uh, another about 13 years, then 2001 to 2011, about 10 years, and then finally 2011 to now, 2020. Very interesting journey uh, I've had. And in fact, while I was preparing for this presentation, it took me a long time because I had to kind of recollect and uh, uh, rewind for myself as well as to what happened and where did, where did, where did I go and uh, whatever happened. Started in 1982. By this time, um, I had an amateur radio license, AP2HJ. This I got in 1977, soon after I graduated from, from the University of Engineering and Technology. And it perhaps was reminiscent of uh, from the amateur radio handbook that I saw when I was uh, 10 years old. And uh, there on my hands-on experimentation with wireless radio technology started. Uh, speaking world over from my uh, comfort of my home, for, um, a term called shack for the place where you keep your radio. And um, you, you get to understand the propagation waves that you had studied in your engineering and everything started making sense all the formulas and all the lectures that we had heard about how the uh, radio waves traveled, they have kind of started unveiling to myself. In addition to that, while I was in the United States doing my master's, Radio Shack and uh, Apple announced their first personal computers. And the geek inside me just woke up and said, whoa, I need to have that. $999, big number. God knows how I saved that money and I got myself Radio Shack TRS-80 personal computer, serial number 79. And I had absolutely no clue what I'm gonna use that for. No clue, did not relate to my work, did not relate to anything, but I just bought myself a computer. And interestingly, when I bought this computer back with me to Pakistan, it was promptly confiscated by Pakistan customs. Boom, banned, banned? I, I couldn't understand why, why would a computer be banned? Well, that's what the law was. 
And yes, microcomputers were banned in Pakistan till 1985 for some higher wisdom, some policy from the British Raj Babus of government of Pakistan. They perhaps knew more than I did. Finally, uh, I made the custom people see that the device that they're holding onto was not a um, computer, it was a black and white television. So they let it go. And that's where it started. Stupidly, foolishly at the time, I used to consider myself a super engineer. And um, in Karachi, while I was talking to my, uh, I was in the bank talking to my banker and bitching about how bleak the job opportunity in Pakistan were, I bumped into a gentleman by the name of Haji Ali Muhammad. May Allah bless him in the eternal. He was also a customer in the bank and uh, just overhearing on whatever was going on. And since he was from the Karachi business community, he kind of told me, put your money where your mouth is. If you think that's smart, go start a business. And honestly, I'd never considered that, never walked the telly at all. So East West Bridge was born in my bedroom and in my car as my quest to bridge the technology gap between the East and the West. That, that's the reason that inspired the name East and West. Now, interestingly, my military dad had programmed my human mind epoch much before that, when I was much younger. And what he preached was that the just uh, earning for anyone was a military career. That was the only hak halal ki kamai, as they put it in Urdu, only honest earning. The bureaucrats were always corrupt, Rishwati. And the businessman, Wow, he's, he's an outright thief, sure. And that's what I started my journey out with. I don't blame my dad for programming me like that because perhaps the military window that he was looking out of had a poster hanging out there somewhere which said exactly that. But uh, later in my life, I learned that this was a uh, grossly fraud generalization. That's really not true. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's not really true. So the radio and computers and my bubbling engineering passion um, created a career for me where I never had to work all my life. Honestly speaking, I never had to. Uh, my late loving wife used to say, um, have you ever worked in your life? Every morning you go to your passion club and your hobby club and you pretend as if you're working. And true, work never seemed like work to me. I really enjoyed what I did. Radios and computers became East West business. That's where it, it started. It was radio communication, telemetry and SCADA, met instrumentation and a mix of radios and, and uh, mix of computers and communication. The company in my bedroom and the trunk of my car, which had the tools of the trade and a dungaree in the trunk. A coat hanging on the rear seat transformed me from a blue-collar blue techie to a white-collar business executive and vice versa as the work would demand. That's how the company started and honest to God, I enjoyed doing that. Business was good, no overhead. The entire revenue was profit. And uh, that's what my initial understanding of business was. My first employee was uh, a uh, slightly junior engineer friend of mine, also from UET Lahore, um, lived close by and um, he joined me. By this time, I still used to work out my bedroom and since he was a friend, he could easily walk into the guest bed downstairs where my room used to be. And we kind of sometimes travel a quarter of the length of the country to go and do some uh, uh, SCADA jobs, or some telemetry jobs. One of the first ones was putting up a telemetry system at the Darkey gas well. Gas well had just then been, been discovered in Darkey and there were some uh, SCADA things that were supposed to be put on that. And both of us um, took a kind of a hobby trip and went and did this. This gentleman incidentally later joined the civil service and only last year retired as a federal secretary um, and a good one at that. My second employee was again a slightly junior engineer friend of mine from NED University Lahore. And uh, he too would travel with me on uh, in whatever way I traveled. And uh, two major jobs that we did in the first two, three years of my business was uh, set up the uh, radio communication system for Islamabad police. So 
Islamabad police had just then been formed, I think it was around 1984 or 85 or something like that. And we put up a radio communication network. And then for KPK police, uh, I'm sorry, it was called NWP police at the time. We had created a lot of problems for the traditional radio communication people in Pakistan. We were youngsters, um, we would do our work with our own hands, go into the meeting with ourselves. And with a different culture of working compared to the traditional people who had inherited businesses from either the British or whatever. So created a big disrupt and East-West Bridge was born. The restless engineer in me was very uncomfortable with the imported technologies. We paid a whole lot of money for the technologies that came from Japan and United States. And I being an engineer would look at the technology from a different perspective. God damn it, why am I paying $400 for this power supply? Oh, geez, $350 for this antenna? I could do, my, do it myself for maybe like $30. And that was the spirit. That forced me to start producing value elements to my business. Like for example, power supplies, antennas, modems. And within two years, I was doing um, local assembly of two-way radios in Pakistan right out of my dining room. God bless my uh, young wife at the time for bearing with my stupid passion and doing it that way. We'd hardly been married, I think, four years or three years or something. And um, my, my dining room was a makeshift uh, assembly line for two-way radios. I used to attend uh, trade shows like Computex in Las Vegas, uh, USA, and Computex in Taiwan. And that opened my horizon. My nascent microcomputer passion made me ride the crest of the microcomputer revolution. Microcomputer was just then coming in. Um, and heck, I happened to be there at the right time, riding uh, the right from the front. Uh, very thrilling. So we established a computer solutions house in Karachi, selling PCs and writing business software uh, to complement the hardware boxes that we used to sell. Businessmen used to have big trouble paying for uh, a floppy drive at the time, which had, say, 30,000 rupees software program. And they used to say, I'm buying such a big box for 30,000 rupees, and you're selling this envelope looking thing with something that you call software, and you're charging me 30,000 rupees for that? No. Well, anyway, uh, the, the, the um, uh, leaders in the industry often feel that kind of a thing. It happens all the time. So by 1986, East-West Bridge evolved into East-West Systems Private Limited, EWS. 1986 was the year. So I hope that answers your question, Bhaktava, about uh, where yeah, it started. In. So, uh, sir, um, how did this company got exposed to the military electronic opportunities? Okay. Next phase of my journey, 1987 to 2000, when we turned to design and integration. Um, there was a lot of knowledge. Now we had the experience as well. And I thought it was, um, and it, it happened that we were at the right place at the right time and we entered design and integration of electronics. In 1987, we were exposed to military electronics uh, where uh, somebody from my dad's past uh, uh, signals um, background, an officer from uh, uh, Coast Guards, who was also a pilot, approached us and said, uh, we need to put up a HF radio equipment inside a helicopter because most of my ground uh, um, uh, peers uh, only have HF radio. Uh, helicopters and aircraft normally have VHF radios and UHF radios, but no HF radios, because HF radios generally require very big antennas. And uh, they said, uh, we can buy one from the United States, but that's gonna cost like 70,000 US dollars and we don't have that kind of funds. So invited me to come and have a look at the helicopter. And Jet Ranger was the first helicopter I saw and uh, my, the geek inside me was jumping with uh, excitement. I said, no problem, Mike. You, you have, uh, uh, there was a Pakistani standard military radio um, issued to almost every military establishment called the PK-786. And he said, I have a PK-786. So I took the PK-786, put it in some place, some place inside the helicopter, made the necessary strapping for that. And how do I connect to an antenna? And this was, uh, the kind of helicopter that I worked on. This thing sticking out from the side of the helicopter is an HF antenna. This particular helicopter belongs to Frontier Corps. Um, the first one was, that I did was for uh, Pakistan Coast Guard. And uh, Lord behold, the system worked. 
and uh, I was filled with joy. Money didn't matter to me at all, and I I don't remember, but I think we did the job for a um, couple of thousand rupees. They gave me the radio, I provided the antenna, and I did the design for the internet tuner and so on. And very soon, uh, Frontier Core and some other people who had similar radios and similar communication objectives started approaching me, and uh, there I was in military electronics. So that was the first exposure. Now, it's important to mention that regional developments created opportunities for East West systems. This is true even today. The developments I'm speaking of at the time was number one, the Indian uh, uh, Army exercise, tri, tri uh, services exercise called Brass Tax in 1986-87. They amassed more than like 700, 800,000 troops, um, hardly 80 kilometers from the Pakistani border. And um, uh, Pakistan was really scared, did not know if it was really an exercise or would they just charge and cross the border. So big tension on, on our side of the border. So Pakistan uh, uh, and Indians called that uh, the Cold Start Doctrine. That, mean, that meant that to start a war, you don't have to make preparations. They're always ready for it. So Pakistan reacted to that. And they had they conducted a military exercise called the Zerbe Mom in 1981. This was also a crisis exercise, and all elements of the armed forces, the army, air force, navy participated. And um, somebody had uh, from from the military network knew that uh, this uh, young guy, a geek, um, a stupid geek, uh, knows a lot of electronics. So they came to my office looking for me and said, "Can you put?" Um, live video and data links on a helicopter so that we can see uh, the commander at the back can see whatever the helicopter is saying and said, whoa, that's an opportunity. About that time, the Russians also withdrew from Afghanistan, 1989. Unfortunately, we lost uh, General Zayal Haq, the president of Pakistan, along with a very large number of uh, army officers. Uh, with the C-130 going down. That changed a lot of things in the Pakistan military as well. New leadership came up, General Mirza Aslam Bey came up. Many other things happened. In the military, it's very common when the leadership changes, even the directions change sometimes. So that created another opportunity. Then soon after that, Gulf War started in 1991, uh, where um, Americans and the coalition forces went about chasing the Iraqis because they had invaded uh, uh, Kuwait. That created another scenario. So these things kind of uh, created the background of why opportunities opened for a company like me and perhaps many others in Pakistan. And in 1987 to 2001, the next 14 years, brought great expansion in the military electronics capability of my company, East West Systems, as it was called at that time. In 1989, as I said, mentioned earlier, uh, during Zirbe Momin, Pakistan Army asked me to put the uh, video data links on their helicopters in the fixed wing aircraft, and we, we produced a product called VTEX, um, video and data transmission system, uh, mounted in aircraft uh, and uh, received live in a command post wherever that might have been, several hundred miles away, several hundred kilometers away. So the product that used to go inside a helicopter would look something like this, not exactly this, but something like this. This particular product was developed many years later in the year 2000, but this was a data and uh, uh, video link. Something like this would go on the, uh, in, the, in the command center where they had received this thing. The transmission was done in microwave. And this was assembled in Pakistan. I wouldn't say it was manufactured in Pakistan, but a lot, a lot of it uh, was uh, assembled in Pakistan with elements that went into this box. And it worked. Uh, we also had to track the aircraft. So we added an air track system where the antenna would chase whatever aircraft was sending the thing. The tracking antenna at the time looked something like this. And uh, so here we were, uh, well dug with our first successful program into the military. It was very rewarding for the ego, or at least my passion. And next, something really interesting happened. In 1991, a Pakistani scientific uh, uh, expedition was supposed to go to South Pole and set up camp for uh, maybe like six months to do scientific research. This was a kind of a tit for tat for some of the other nations who had their um, expeditions sitting on the South Pole or the North Pole and Pakistan was no less than nobody. And I instantly volunteered to be the positioning and communication specialist. And the reason I claimed to be one was because 
uh, positioning on the South Pole where you only have um, uh, ice to go by, you need some sort of positioning tool. And as my destiny and as the Lama Iqbal's poetry said, uh, earlier in 1979, when I was in, uh, in the United States, I happened to um, um, get some experience using a GPS positioning system called the Transit, based on a satellite constellation called the Transit. This was the precursor to the Navstar GPS system that was to come many years later. Also during that time, I rubbed shoulders uh, with um, a gentleman who later became the founder of the world's first GPS company, Garmin, Mr. Min Kao, Dr. Min Kao. The, the, the Min in Garmin is his um, family name, Dr. Min Kao. So as soon as I heard that we are going to the South Pole, I quickly contacted Garmin. At that time, remember, we only had telexes or letters, or you'd book a call and take three hours for the call to get through. So I sent him a telex. I didn't have a telex machine in my, uh, in my um, office. Very difficult to acquire a telex machine. So um, they were paid telex services where you'd go and uh, type out a message and send it. And I told Garmin that I understand you have a development board with which you we can create a GPS. So there is this opportunity. I'm going to the South Pole, and I'd like to uh, uh, use that board and so on and so forth. And I threw some old references where I told uh, uh, Dr. Menkow that we met at such and such university in such and such place and so on and so forth. And uh, very lucky, Garmin sent me the board. And I had a, a, a desktop, laptop desktop computer. In fact, there were no laptops. They were portable computers at the time. And I connected it to that board and uh, applied all kind of thing. And, Bingo, I had position. I could get lat long of wherever I was. And so I had tools of going to, to the South Pole and HF long range communication was anyway my, my baby, my, my forte. So this for me was another picnic to the South Pole. Sadly, the expedition was called off for various reasons. I'm not going to go into reasons. But I trained myself on using a GPS and I familiarized myself with the uh, the positive system. My PhD thesis, in, in, interestingly, was also um, of a similar subject, externally excited navigation system. And they're trying to imply that to navigate, you, you can have external things like uh, satellites and stars and so on. So as I said, destiny had uh, put things in place for me. Uh, I hope, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm ahead of you. 1991, Operation Desert Storm came in. And uh, this was a clip-on GPS navigation um, event, whereby all the American aircraft that were to fly as a part of the coalition in the Gulf War, all the British aircraft, they flew in Garmin GPSs and clipped them on the instrument panel of the aircraft because uh, um, they had no way of finding targets inside the barren desert of Iraq. Pakistani Air Force was also part of that coalition and they Pakistani uh, navigator and Pakistani aviators got to see the GPS uh, clipped on to uh, the American and the British aircraft. Move forward 1993, PF desired tools used in the Gulf War and contacted Garmin and said they want to do first of the type installation of GPS navigators in their fighter aircraft. Garmin immediately got in touch with me. This is a crazy man. You got a development board from us, and we understand you know uh, GPS. Here is a letter from PAF, and would you like to uh, um, go and do the first of type installation? I, I could not have been more excited. And I did the first type installations of uh, a, a, a GPS in two fighter aircraft. First, uh, the Fantan A5, our ground support aircraft. This was the aircraft that I installed the first GPS in in Peshawar in something like December 1993. And the actual installation looked like this. This was the first uh, aviation GPS called the GPS 100 AVD. And I quickly taught the pilots on how to use it. And they did the first two or three sorties and they came back related. My God, they, they didn't have to do no navigation at all. The goddamn machine told them everything. And that was the uh, starting of uh, the GPS era. And then we went about installing GPSs in almost anything and everything that flew. Um, Army aviation, uh, uh, fixed wing and helicopters, PF F7s, PF Mirages, PF Naval Mirages, 
And interestingly, even at Bangladesh airports, mid 29s, eight of them. Uh, this is interesting. This is the Bangladesh airports, mid 29, bought brand new from uh, Russia, but the time did not have any advanced avionics. And uh, they had been told that some countries have uh, integrated Western avionics in um, uh, Russian aircraft. And uh, there was this RFQ to which we responded, the Chinese responded, and a Czech company responded. Remember, at that time, there were not many GPS experts world, world over. So it was just a few. And as expected, the Pakistani price was the best, and we, we were invited to install in the Bangladesh airports. And this was the installation. This particular installation was slightly more complex than uh, was in uh, the Pakistani aircraft. And, uh, but this was also uh, 2004, 10 years later. And this was a Garmin GNS 530, which was far more advanced mapping, blah, blah, blah in the Bangladesh Air Force uh, MiG-29. So that was my exposure to uh, um, uh, aviation. For the personal amendments, open floodgates of opportunities. And we moved from our modest Karachi facility to an elaborate research and production facility in Islamabad in July, 1995. And now the company was one more time reorganized as East West Infinity Limited, the name we are called by today. So, Bakhtavar, I think this kind of, kind of tells you how we ended up in the military technologies business. Absolutely, sir. And it was very interesting to know the whole uh, process. Uh, so, we do understand that your company was the pioneer in the UAVs in Pakistan in the 1990s. So, can you tell us about how this all came up? Once again, events in, in the area, they make it happen. Even perhaps, I'm, I'm sure when there's big deadly conflict in the world today, Somebody out there is enjoying the opportunity of selling more arms. And that's how it happened to us. We, do, we did not sell any arms, but we dealt in military, military electronics technology. So UAVs were a wanted commodity by all countries after seeing the success that the Israelis had in Lebanon and Syria. You'd be surprised the Americans did not have a serious UAV program by 1991. And uh, the uh, Israelis already had functional UAVs. So almost... When the nations who could develop their own started, and nations like us um, also started. And uh, 1993, Suparco, like all um, uh, Pakistani decisions, they can trust a state establishment. Nobody gets fired for giving a job to a state, state establishment, even if nothing works. But if someone uh, in the decision making were to give a job to a private sector and the, the project would fail, he would lose his job. So that's why the project went to Suparco to develop a UAV for the Pakistan Army. The gentleman who was leading it, um, a, a person I hold in high respect, Raja Sabri Khan, the MIT laureate, uh, aerospace engineer, he um, embarked on making a UAV for the uh, for Suparco. And EWS, my company, was invited to uh, do the data links and um, electronics for that, just like we did for the helicopters and everything else. Very glad to be there. Unfortunately, the program did not go anywhere because they had tied Raja Sabri Khan's hands behind his back, working in a government organization. You cannot be innovative and you cannot lead things. So the program crashed. As I said, we moved to Islamabad in 1996 and uh, UAVs were fresh and we knew everyone in the world wanted a UAV. And by this time, Pakistan Army had, had uh, notified a formal requirement of what kind of UAV they wanted. So we came about uh, and met some people here uh, who called themselves Satuma, and we went and bought them out and formed a company called Satuma Infinity Technologies uh, Private Limited, a dedicated UAV company, which, was, um, which would operate out of the same building that we were in. And um, a surveillance UAV was created called Jasus. It met the requirements of uh, Army requirements of 80 kilometers of range, five hours of autonomous flight and endurance, and the UAV was successful. Um, this was the Satuma Infinity Jasus. If you notice, the command center at the back is, is a trolley uh, truck with a, 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 and I think the gentleman sitting at the back of the truck is perhaps me, I can't really recognize. And this Jeep used to tow this um, aircraft from our uh, facility here in uh, Islamabad to the Fatehjang airway and uh, we crashed a few of these aircraft because no aircraft program is successful unless um, it's gone through the mistakes and we did we, we uh, did a few mistakes. This is a clearer picture and uh, the name Infinity Jasus uh, 
2008WC Bravo, if you notice. It's got a meaning to it. I'll come to that a little later. So this was the aircraft we, we developed. This could fly for five hours, um, 80 kilometers of um, uh, range, lighter time and so on. So forth. Everything that somebody wanted in a year, very successful. Here is the third one. Uh, you can, now this is to tell the size of the aircraft. Um, so you can tell how big it is and uh, uh, pretty capable. It could uh, lift the kind of payload that Pakistan wanted and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, till 1999, we did not sell a dime's worth of aircraft to nobody. The who's of who, who's of who in army saw the demonstration of this thing, including General Musharraf at the end, General Aziz, whoever mattered at the time. Everyone had seen the UAV. And it was so disturbing that at the end of the demonstration, two hours flight, uh, uh, when the aircraft would land, they say, oh, excellent, uh, you've done a wonderful job and kind of give you gifts and all that, but no orders. Unfortunately, internally we were bleeding and we perhaps could not survive uh, the UOV program. So in the last presentation, when uh, customary with the armed forces, uh, they said, um, you are very patriotic and this is for the nation and this is for this and this is for that. And I knew I didn't have money to pay the salaries the next month. So when my time came to uh, give a, uh, my two minute speech, I said, well, all of us are patriotic. The ones who are wearing blue are patriotic. The ones who are wearing hockey are patriotic. The ones um, who are wearing white are patriotic. And the ones like us who are wearing technicolor, uh, we are also very patriotic. One minor difference. The ones who are in these three colors, the first colors I mentioned, they get a paycheck at the end of the month and their wives don't drive them out, drive them out of the house. And the technicolor patriotics like us, our wives have already threatened us that you don't bring the money next month and you don't get to eat the food at home. So that's where our patriotism is going. Unfortunately, nothing happened. And there was a lot of fun. Or a lesson to the people in the army. Uh, work for the army if you, if you want to have fun. Enjoy it. Nobody buys in the army. They'd rather buy from uh, maybe uh, wherever else, but not from Pakistan. This is the last uh, uh, console. I think this was the demonstration where General Musharraf was sitting and many other people were sitting. This was the state of uh, technology at that time. It's about 1999, I guess. And the man on the console is me. I still had black hair at the time and uh, no sail. This was a tracking antenna which would track a UAV at 100 miles and um, uh, bring in live data. No sales. Another opportunity came by for UAVs where KRL needed a high speed target drone to test their uh, UNSA anti aircraft missile. Pakistan Army was not really convinced that this missile would actually hit an aircraft in a real uh, situation, so they needed to test it with something. I, have, I hold Dr. A. Khan in very high respect. So he called us and had a, a um, casual conversation. I said, you guys, uh, you kind of uh, play with the um, aircraft. Can you develop high-speed target drones? And boom, thunder, um, thunder in Pashto was created. And uh, Dr. A. Khan bought I think 20 of these from us. This was under, this had the uh, 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 rail launcher. The trolley at the bottom was also the carrier for two of these aircraft. And this was a successful program. We really did not care about the money at the time. Uh, it, it was just the accomplishment that was our uh, earning at that time. And Sutuma Infinity Thunder was the aircraft at the time, high-speed target drone. Excellent. This did pay, but no repeat orders. So, interesting. Soon after this event, oi, ye to phat gaya. Kis idiot ne order diya tha? This was a sentence of nearly the, uh, the second highest ranking officer in Pakistan Army. Uh, we, he was uh, visiting us and we were giving a presentation in our boardroom. And we also showed a video where we tested the Anza missile on uh, uh, our target drone, and it actually went and hit the drone, and the drone exploded. And he said, oh, yeah, so, but yeah, kiss idiot needs to order the other. So his number two was sitting right next to him. He was kind of sheepishly said, uh, sir, that was the objective, actually. It proved that in, in a real combat, this is going to 
और रियल कॉम्बैट तो है लेकिन ये दस लाख रुपए नुकसान तो हो गया ही काइंड ऑफ मिस द एंटायर आइडिया अबाउट टारगेट फोन बट सो इट वॉज सो वी कुड नॉट अफोर्ड एनी मोर लॉसेज and the reluctantly um, at that time uh, the gentleman the officer who was heading a uh, uh, air weapons complex came to me and said uh, arun you can't sell nothing to the armed forces so what are you going to do about that and honestly speaking we were about to shut the program in the next 15 days because i did not have the money to pay the salary so i, I offered him i said if you can do something about uh, this this program that we have we have three or four flying aircraft and we have ground control stations we have this and that take it away and uh, give me my development cost he said agree but there is one catch i do not have the development cost to pay how much do you um, spend in this and i said the close to 700000 us dollars said, okay i can sign a iou for you when we have the money we will pay you so you transfer this entire program i was too happy to pass it on to uh, air weapons complex and they renamed it as project bravo and then project bravo plus part of the program also went to pmo where pmo renamed the aircraft uh, replicas of what we are doing uh, at um, our facility including the mistakes that we had thought we were going to fix in the next iteration and they called their program okab i am glad uh, um, pakistan navy is operating okab right now so something good happened with a with a two year program but interestingly the uav um was a very big business failure we we decided to divest in uh, in satuma could not afford them any more and that was the uav story sir so, um uh, i know that we are getting short on time but we still have a lot to learn from you so moving on to the next question very quickly that uh, uh, you had actually uh, mentioned that you refused your us immigration as well at some point in your life why was that so i need to share this also with with the audience these are these are life stories they they're not a, a kind of experiments in the lab my us immigration materialized in 1996 as result of application filed by my elder brother perhaps in 1982 or something there off when i was in united states uh, the us government had a siblings program where uh, us uh, citizens could uh, uh, file immigration for their uh, siblings and my mine matured in 1996 like 12 13 years later when i received the uh, the notice from the us embassy about uh, coming for an interview i was in a different phase of my life different phase of my career and usa did not seem like a like a good destination for me but anyway we uh, decided to discuss the pros and cons of going to us the evening before the big interview uh, my wife uh, my three children Uh, of whom the eldest was 13 at the time so only he could understand what we were talking about the younger two was too excited we are going to america we are going to america and my dad um, who was a retired military officer and my then living with me and we discussed the pros and cons the the pros uh, cited uh, were that better um, higher education better health care better uh, quality of life and the cons were that you lose your roots um, you lose con- uh, kind of your uh, connection to your country perhaps your values and stuff like that my take on that was that um, higher education um, is good in america but you don't need immigration to have higher education if you have the means you can um, uh, send your children for higher education even while living in in another country and if healthcare was really ultimate my mom should have been alive today my mom died of uh, leukemia at the cancer at the stanford cancer center in california they could not extend her life so that meant the healthcare in america was also had its limits and the god has plans for everyone so that too was a kind of a partial thing anyway fast forward by 2 am in the night we decided we will not avail the opportunity god bless my late wife for supporting me all the way uh, but my eldest son had just said abu has gone nuts he went and told the younger ones we are not going to america abu is crazy and uh, next morning we did not have a pair for the interview and the chapter closed i am happy to report 25 years later now today i am glad the decision proved wonderful for the family uh, as we speak i am the only family home left in pakistan for my sibling for most of my relatives most of them in their younger life uh, decided to go to america and now are living uh, um, well whatever i'm not going to comment on that but i'm still here in pakistan very happy with what we did 
That's very interesting. I hope that answers. Sir. Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, like after you moved your establishment to Islamabad, uh, what products? What are the products that you innovate and produce under this? I'll quickly run through because I'm running short on time. As I said, uh, because of the pressure um, restrictions, a lot of military opportunities started uh, um, appearing for our company. And since uh, if they were to try and do a solution for themselves in a military establishment, funding is required. Many things have happened. We were in the private sector, so nothing is required. We'd often have a major or a colonel or a brigadier walk up and say, can you make this device? Can you do this? Can you do that? And heck, we were excited. We, we almost accepted everything. So I'm just going to mention some of the major programs that they did. The purpose being to, to, to exhibit what is real business and what is just excitement in play to try and differentiate. At that time, I could not differentiate. One of the first products we made was a product called TVPC, so anti-tank missile vehicle power system. US had denied it to Pakistan, so we were interested to go uh, try and make this. This was a product made in Pakistan, and this was a guidance system it used to go in. I'm gonna tell you about this picture a little later. So, um, this, the product was developed, worked successfully, sold uh, uh, several of them to uh, Pakistan Army, a large, large number to Pakistan Army. We really, really didn't care how much it, it cost and how much we sold them for, but because the accomplishments seemed too big. And then, as my luck would have it, many years later, uh, about six, seven years later, the Saudi armed forces came to us uh, via the internet and asked me, do you make this product uh, for the American weapon system? And I said, we do. He didn't believe me, actually. But when we went further, they placed a large order for the same product uh, for the Saudi land forces. And this picture is from the tow maintenance facility in Tabuk, Saudi Arabia. We sold a large number to them uh, for their upgradation from tow one to tow two. Uh, the gentleman on the left is the representative of the manufacturer of the missile in, uh, in the United States. The gentleman on the right is an ex-Pakistani um, uh, military man in CVs now um, working for uh, the Saudi land forces. And this was a product, big success for us. Um, although no repeat orders though, because uh, uh, such products do not sell every day. Such products uh, sell once in a while, but we made money and uh, I can classify this as a success. 1979 and 1999, we were asked to uh, develop the fire control system for the T69 um, variant of the Pakistani tank. Uh, called Al Zarar. Uh, we quickly developed one, somehow was not accepted, never went into production, business failure. About the same time, we were asked to develop the battlefield management system for uh, the T 72 main battle tank. Very excitedly, we went about and um, quickly came up with prototypes. System did not go into production, business failure. The device we produced at that time looked something like this. Basically, uh, um, uh, the youngsters of today would. Uh, would see this product almost in, in vehicle tracking systems or something every day. But at that time in 1988, 1999, this was um, some sort of a technology uh, achievement. 1998, 99 was another very, very, very interesting uh, program called Asman. Uh, Dr. A.Q. Khan once again approached us and said, can you develop something to track um, the Ghari transcontinental uh, missile? Uh, we want to track the trajectory of this missile because this goes uh, nearly into the outer space and then re-enters the Earth. How do you track this missile? Oh, full of excitement. We immediately started uh, brainstorming in the show. In, in two hours time, yes, we can do it. Uh, I don't know if we could have not, but we surely told um, Dr. Khan that we could do it. And he, was, he smiled. He was much more mature and he gave us a job. About a year later, the system worked. Um, and uh, uh, for the subsequent several test firing, Asman performed for uh, um, the Ghari missile. Excellent achievement, excellent achievement, um, uh, satisfaction. 1996, Air Force came to us and they were just about to induct the F-7P aircraft and said, we need to source an identify friend or foe uh, device, but it has to be made in Pakistan. And we do not have the, the money to set up a factory. So. You guys seem to be very excited and you seem to have the money as well. Uh, is there a possibility that you transfer technology and make in Pakistan? And uh, led by Pakistan Air Force's Shine Foundation with a 10% partnership in our coalition, 
we went to china we went to france we went to italy we went to uk looking for who was willing to transfer a reliable identifier friend of hope french finally agreed spent big money signing transfer technology agreements and we being the private sector want to ensure that uh, we do really get true transfer technology but somehow the product did not go into production this time no fault of, of the system this time and in in conflict between the khaki and the blue i will not go into the details and the program was scrapped they ended up buying iff from china 1970 97 99 ps missile acquisition tracking practice system for the french mistral missile once again this was a french missile for which we were supposed to to create a device which could uh, be used for uh, um, training our uh, uh, missile operators and um, of course we could not source any kind of electronics from france dr atu khan was more than willing to share the seekers that they used to have used for the anza missile and we were challenged to use a anza seeker and make a french mistral device this was the device we finally managed to produce this is a device actually deployed in one of the point defense bases somewhere and looks like a rail missile uh, functions like a rail missile but doesn't have a rocket motor in it and trains the gunner to actually engage real incoming aircraft and this picture uh, on the right you see the the french missile and on the left you see made in pakistan um, and the two gentlemen in the series is uh, me and dr navid jami and rest of them are the users of this program program was a success but unfortunately did not go into production did not go into the reasons but then they're not because of us it was a business failure last uh, item that i'm going to mention in what we developed during that time was the grc 105 ground to air transceiver uh, again us denials in 93 94 95 and they wanted to have a ground to air radio which could communicate with civilian aircraft as well as military aircraft and uh, we were excited quickly developed something in 94 96 and uh, pakistan rb ended up buying um, several from us and we thought well madani i but little did i know that uh, that very product um, we sold a large quantity to international customers for 2.5 million dollars over the over the next 15 years so i'll classify is it as a big business success and uh, the transceiver is still being produced some variants are being produced and we are looking into um, software defined radios to go inside and i think uh, the such radios are going to be produced in the coming years but business success as far as i'm concerned and this was the grc 105 i think this picture dates uh, to something like 2004 5 when we exported a large number to indonesia interestingly the us state department also ordered these from us we were very surprised um the story at some other time why the americans would buy this from us other other countries i could understand in indonesia sri lanka malaysia burma uh, south arabia why the state department mm, interesting another another time you need to invite me for uh, see if you want to hear the story so that was the uh, military part of uh, what we did one more interesting part that you made which had nothing to do with military in 97 to 2020 we still produce this is a traffic speed camera called the speed witness pakistan motorway police started uh, pakistan uh, first motorway started operating in 1997 and some officers in uh, in the in the motorway police came to uh, ewi since we were radios and everything it says can you make a traffic speed camera and i said we never refused the challenge we made a traffic speed camera and they bought the first ones from us in 1997 and this one Uh, i think is perhaps dated to something like 2004 or 5 or something and if you notice you have a big battery box at the bottom there's a tripod and there's a lot of electronics and lasers and so, so on so forth and we sold we continue to sell every year or every second third year to motor police but product keeps evolving every few years new technology comes in because you can't really keep on selling old technology and uh, this is the version that uh, was developed somewhere in 2017 or something there or speed witness uh, high definition video and snapshot this takes both still and uh, uh, videos and so on so forth successful product and uh, we we added a tablet at the back whereby this was self contained unit and you notice there are no batteries your phone doesn't have external batteries so why should a speed camera have external batteries there's lithium batteries inside big success
Should I stop? So, or you, you have any more yeah. questions? <laughs> I, I do have because uh, having suffered like so many losses on the military activities, um, how did you mitigate the future? Okay. 2001 to 2011, the big loss of the UE program, several other big losses, the uh, IF, IFF system and several other things. And uh, I think the passion had to be subdued. Uh, my passion had to be brittle and a senior uh, from the mind business plan uh, were formed. We decided not to get excited and uh, start running after the military wish list and do something more professional. And we, we came up with a better mix of professional and industrial electronics in the next 10 years. First product, Metalog 2000. This was a meteorological data logger for collecting uh, renewable energy sources. This, this is a product. Commonly people call it a automatic weather station, but this is made in Pakistan. And we've, we've since been selling variants to, to everyone who has a need for such a thing. We developed a Sonolog 7000, the sonic water level and tide gauge system. And uh, Pakistan uh, National Institute of Oceanography was the first customer. This, is, this was one of the first loggers installed in Gawadar at one of their tidal observatories. This was sonic, no water contact, and uh, so on. So successful product from that point of view. And um, sonic head. And this is a picture of the tidal weather uh, data collection center at Gawadar at where this was installed. I'm glad to report whatever we made, wherever we applied our uh, knowledge to actual technology did actually find application, good application, and good use for the human mankind. FM broadcasting was open to the private sector in 2003. Once again, this was opportunity in the waiting for us. We had to do nothing. Radio was our bread and butter, and we started selling radio transmitters. To date, we have sold about 130 radio stations in Pakistan. Collectively, there are about 200, maybe 50 odd stations, and we have installed 130. But we also saw an opportunity for made in Pakistan FM transmitters and antennas and so on. This is one of the Pakistani made products. Uh, very, sells very successfully, but we kind of position it rightly in the, low, uh, in the low and medium power segment of small cities and so on and so forth. Very successful. Made antennas for, for ourselves as well. And this was a big knowledge converter for us. $100 or $50 of metal gets converted into a $1,000 antenna. Rest of it is a little fabrication and a lot of knowledge. Big success. Broadcast audio loggers, profanity delay systems, airborne eyes, another very interesting thing. The helium filled airships uh, flown electrically to get that carried payloads, radio direction finder, whisper watch, multi channel sweeping receivers, uh, something in which you put up the receiver up in the air and um, so somebody at the ground control station can go and listen to many people at the same time. All of this was done. Automatic uh, bottom profiling system to do. Uh, um, depth measurements of water channels and make a bottom profile automatically uh, was done by a successful product. We still make it, but it's not the kind of product that sells every day. We maybe sell a couple every few years, but a business success from that point of view. And- um, All right. So sir, what have your company's activities been in the last 10 years? So I'll close it with the last two or three slides here. 2011 to 2020 was a transition into the next generation of technologies. It is important that the enterprises transition and continue to evolve even after the founders head towards the twilight like I am. So a, a transition plan had to be made. Mine was made by Allah, just destined it for me. EWI has transitioned to the next generation. Engineer Mohammed Mustafa Qureshi returned from USA after doing his electronic engineering in 2009. And um, um, he, uh, by his own choice, decided to work in the family business. And now 11 years later, he is the chief operating officer and the project director in the company. And uh, with him, uh, with a young mind, he brings a new in innovation and technology line. Like for example, renewable energy assessment. We are the uh, dominant player in this market. We, we do renewable energy assessment for nearly every uh, wind energy producer in, um, in Pakistan, mostly in Sin. And recently, two in Balochistan, they'll start producing they have good commercial wind in some areas in Balochistan, and we will perhaps start producing uh, energy in Balochistan in the coming uh, uh, years or something like that. This is what it looks like. The turbines you see in the background are actually producing energy, and the tower you see in the foreground is the one which is doing the instrumentation, saying how much wind there is and how much should the generator be producing and so on. And EWI is uh, the dominant player in this market. Now the pie of our, uh, of our uh, business right now divided into many areas. Uh, 
I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but the only reason, one key reason for our survival is that we don't have our eggs in one basket. Our, we, we divide our business um, uh, into several baskets, some which kind of pay the next morning, some that pay in maybe six months time and some which pay after three years, but big money in there. So a big balance in there. And that's where we are today. One key uh, instrument that I need to mention, thing that we did because this relates also to Pakistan Aerospace Council, is glass cockpits, which are the future of airborne aviation instrumentation. And uh, EWI is the leader. And this leadership uh, kind of was created because had I not been exposed to transit in 1979, had I not um, desired to go to the South Pole in 1991, um, I would not have been introduced to, to this segment of technology. And the only reason I am is because that, that destiny was built for me and for my company. We have successfully engineered, designed, integrated glass cockpits in the Super Mushak aircraft, resulting in the sales of about 65 aircraft to international buyers valued at over 55 million US dollars. There's not many companies in the world who can do that. And uh, we are blessed to have done that for Pakistan uh, um, Aeronautical Complex Camera. We do the first, we do the design, the fabrication of the first system, first in, install and then serial production is then done by themselves. I'm gonna kind of quickly run through and not say what the uh, glass cockpit does, but this is how it looks. This is how one of the uh, Mashak cockpit now looks. This system is in use in one of the Middle Eastern users. And uh, this is the next iteration. It's not a, really the current uh, kind of a uh, thing that's going for the current programs, but nearly identical. Only two glass screens. Uh, the dials have now been removed because they're not necessary anymore. They can, these machines are very reliable, so they don't need standby conventional instruments and so on. So the glass cockpit was a big thing for us, and EWI has a lot of potential of providing competitive services to international markets in this emerging aviation technology. Uh, for example, I would be perfectly willing to uh, integrate it in any aircraft for who knows um, $20,000, $15,000. Uh, a US player in, with, with similar experience would not do it for less than $50,000. So there's the competitive edge. And uh, being in this region, um, the, the most small aircraft which desire this kind of operation cannot fly to United States. So here I am, we position right. Sir, I'm actually very thrilled to know the kind of advancement, the kind of inventions that you and your company has created. Now, as we are proceeding towards the end of our discussion, um, how would you conclude your talk about your journey coming uh, from the man with the gray hair now? <laughs> I'm, I'm proud of my gray hair, honestly, because um, I, I have a sense of accomplishment that I may not have made as much money as uh, maybe many others, but the level of satisfaction is in, in terms of what I accomplished in terms of uh, doing something for the country, doing something for something. And I hope uh, my children and the people who rub shoulders with me in my lifetime will remember me as somebody who imparted something. I readily impart knowledge to the next generation because I think that's your truly take home once you go into that small place in the ground. So conclusion is what technologies are viable for successful production in Pakistan and with a global market potential. American examples are a no-go in Pakistan. Maybe the British examples are a no-go. Maybe the German examples are. I do not know which examples are doable or not doable, but Pakistan has its own unique set of um, uh, conditions and which products will be successful in, in Pakistan uh, may not be successful in the United States and surely will not be successful in China. Every, uh, the, the, the market is different for, every, for everyone. So my life experience tells me that whatever products that you want to make in Pakistan must have an intellectual and um, brain and knowledge power that goes in. Number two, the product must have a high unit price. This is uh, kind of, you know, um, it doesn't make sense. People want low price items. Why am I saying my, pro my product has to have a high price? Because that's the only way I will be able to sell with, with a low um, uh, kind of um, economic um, numbers required to sustain. And the product volumes must be low. That's the third key thing for a product to succeed in Pakistan. And I have a reason and rationale for that. Strange, you would say. The product mix must have variable business payback cycles. People in the business will understand what payback cycles mean. I buy this product today. I do some work on this and create a monster out of this and sell the monster after 10 days. Somebody comes to buy the monster on the 15th day and I get paid back on the 20th day. 
So my business payback cycle from the date I started to the date I received the money is 25 days. I can pay my salary. That's my gravy. Then they have to be products which make me big money, uh, but do not sell every day. Maybe they sell uh, like um, five units per month or 10 units per month. And they are kind of my, they do my, the bottom line uh, on, on my books at the end of the year. They, they create the profit. And so that means my mix of technologies must have some products of that sort. And lastly, there must be some products which make big money and satisfy my uh, uh, passion as well. And uh, so um, that class of uh, products are the real um, earnings that I take home and I can buy or change my next car or make a house or do things like that. So my mix has to have these three different kind of products, may, maybe many products, but these three different payback cycles, and that is the rationale. The reason why I say that the product I may, uh, we should make, uh, we uh, viable in Pakistan should have a high unit price and a low volume is because if there is a product which has a low value and very high volume, just, just like your mobile phones, the Chinese will, will uh, beat your pants off. It, you cannot uh, succeed in Pakistan. It has to be something like the GRC 105 which sells for $18,000. Chinese are not interested in that market. The Americans sell for $60,000. So there's a natural uh, segment that we, we can sell to. And lastly, my cardinal words for Pakistani business, do not rely or bank on any government support for, for sustainability of your business. If your business uh, banks on any government concessions or any government policies, they are bound to fail sooner or later. So your business must stand on its own feet and must sell the car without any support from anyone. Mustafa, does that yeah. tell you where absolutely. I am? So in the last that uh, we would love to ask you, what is the advice that you can give to the future entrepreneurs? This answer, uh, a lot of my friends will totally disagree with me. But then again, I have uh, for three years of experience to, uh, to kind of share with people. So I'm talking from my experience. I have my own take on this. I have trouble with the Western entrepreneurial model, the startups, the first and the second round, funding the exit strategies, and maybe public offerings in that. Okay, that's, that's a typical uh, Western model of entrepreneurial uh, landscape. It is preached that successful entrepreneurial outcomes require passion and dedication. Up to this point, I, I totally sponsor that. I, I, that's the only way business will work. You have to be passionate about it and you have to have dedication. But then can you sell your baby that you nurtured with passion? That's the point where I start differing from the rest of the model. You may sell the products of your passion. Whatever you created, you can sell it to, to whoever wants to buy it and a lot of them to buy it. But you cannot sell the enterprise that produced that product. They say the term used serial entrepreneur. I, I am sure um, that must work for some people, but somehow I cannot uh, get to see it that way. And my reasoning is supported by the uh, alternate way of um, um, uh, entrepreneurship. Family-owned businesses uh, over the last 100 years in Europe, Italy, G Germany, Spain, India, and Japan, um, they do not, if they're successful, they do not sell their businesses. If they fail, they try again. If I were to fail, I'll try again. But we do not sell our businesses. If the business model does not work, I'll change the model and go somewhere else and do something else, but I will not sell my enterprise. That's, my, that's where I differ from the, from the Western model. Innovation often comes from passionate and smaller people-owned enterprise. Rarely does innovation come from corporate enterprise. That's my, my statement for you. I'm sorry, I, I took a lot of time. And I hope uh, the Sir, time I think we're the... just moving towards the uh, end part of our discussion, which is the last question that being the president of Pakistan Aerospace Council, what is your vision for this organization? These are things which are very close to my heart. And when I talk of things like this, uh, somehow I can't control my emotions. Pakistan Aerospace Council was founded in 2018 as a brainchild of a legendary and out of the box thinking um, industrial innovator and my mentor, Mr. Imtiaz Rastar. He indeed is a legend. He along with a few like-minded uh, eminent names um, thought that there is a need to create the aerospace council. That council is now, I'll go into details of council later, but that council is now held aloft by a very committed and voluntary executive committee. 
uh, all of us um, volunteer, in fact, contributed to this organization. None of us are paid. We don't take money home. And I am so privileged to be the president of this August organization. This is indeed an honor. Pakistan Aerospace Council is actually a cluster organization for enterprises who are either active in the aerospace, defense, and high-tech market in Pakistan, or aspire to do so. This is not only for people who are already in the aerospace, but for people who, who possibly have a product or an idea which has an application in the, in the, in the aerospace sector. Why would they want to change their com comfort zone and come into the aerospace sector? I'll, I'll go to that. Form for uh, global promotion of the high value addition and high technology players of Pakistan. High value addition means once again, I, I uh, buy this pen and I convert this into a, um, some sort of a triggering device. That's the value addition I did. The pen was only 10 rupees, but the device I converted this into is now 100 rupees. That's value addition. And this is only usually done in high technology players to meet our domestic aerospace uh, technology needs. And uh, truly speaking, to uh, uh, to do export-led sustainable growth in the global aerospace engineering segment. I'll explain to you why that, that sounds so big. Pakistan Aerospace Council endeavors to develop members, aviation and related technologies and improve visibility of the Pakistani aerospace to the globe, the entire world. I'm, Pakistanis perhaps already know us. We have to go to the, to the globe. We are living in a global village. And so that means there are no boundaries which stop my product. We aim to cater for the interests of our members on the political and policy making in, within Pakistan. And facilitate networking between the members. Uh, you make the pen, I make the ink, he's got the box, let's make a product. That's how we network. And uh, um, promote through attendance of major business events and aim at a well-functioning triple helix structure between industry, academia, and the government. The first two, inshallah, uh, with the support of those valuable members, we will be able to gel the industry and the academia. The government, I need your prayers. And only God can do that. Industrial know-how, industrial do-how, and process knowledge in the traditional high-tech industry can also be applied in the high-value aerospace segment. That is the basic thing with, that we're trying to preach. You have some, some speciality. Why do you sell it to, uh, uh, to the low value markets? Try and sell it to the high value markets. Aircraft manufacturers source parts and elements for the aircraft from hundreds of vendors. These vendors source their parts from a supply chain that extends to thousands of vendors. Pakistani industry needs to be a part of that chain. Here, the people's understanding is that aerospace industry is a big deal. Not true, not true. There are only a few ma aircraft majors, but there are thousands of people who are working to capacity serving that particular industry. And that is where we are trying to take the Pakistani industrial sector into. Perhaps our children will make aircraft, but for, for now, we are, we are trying to put you into that big market. Parts made using some advanced processes and knowledge say for the automobile industry, may only be able to fetch $25 per piece and may require 12,000 pieces per year uh, while, um, and, um, for, to, make, to make an economy of scale. But an identical part for the, automobile, for the aircraft industry could easily fetch $250. And you wouldn't need to make 12,000 parts a year. 1,200 parts is good to, to, for, for that economy of scale and to break even and you have rest of the 12 months left to do some of the things that, that your industry is capable of doing. That's what we are trying to preach. A low value automobile seat manufacturer can provide, uh, possibly provide aircraft seats uh, to command a much higher price and yet continue to make auto seats. I'm not going to give you examples, but that this particular example has been done in Pakistan where uh, the seat manufacturer of Honda or Toyota is selling seats to the aircraft industry now. Pakistan has a very potent, young uh, technical manpower. Fairly organized traditional industry, it potentially stands on a launch pad to take its share of the one trillion market, world aviation engineering market, one trillion US dollars. 
uh, how do I quantify this one trillion dollars US market uh, market in the world? I'm going to try and um, show you how, how the Dreamliner, Boeing Dreamliner, is made. Most people think Boeing makes the aircraft. Quickly go through this, and you'll find out there is there are about uh, two dozen major sub major vendors who supply parts to the Boeing, and Boeing puts it together. And uh, these these vendors are in Korea, in uh, uh, Japan, um, Italy, when you name it. I'm not going to go through details. We spend short time. But these are the major vendors. Each of these major vendors has thousands of sub vendors doing their small little part. I'm uh, I'm not seeing any Pakistan in there. I'm not seeing any uh, other smaller countries in there because we do not recognize the opportunity. Here's another picture. This is not very clear. So I'm not. But in this picture, here on the left side, you see two Chinese names. The reason I, I dug out this poor picture out of uh, my database was that the one at the top is uh, Shenyang Aircraft Corporation. This is a company which makes F-6 aircraft uh, for Pakistan. If they are making F-6 aircraft, why are they making parts for Boeing? Come down and you see Chengdu Aircraft Industrial Group. This is your JF-17 partner in China. Wow. That means their, their business is not making military aircraft. They're also, since aircraft is an aircraft, military or otherwise. So they're making parts for Boeing. Traditionally, not supposed to be best of the friends, but then business is business. And you see many others. I've just been told that the floorboards now and the latest Dreamliners, um, just before the COVID um, breakdown, were being done in India. I'd like to see Pakistan in there, perhaps in the next two, three, four years. Let's all work towards that. That's what we are trying to um, uh, coax everyone to go into. Now, to, to put a perspective on what this one trillion market, uh, dollar market means, uh, Pakistan Aeronautical Complex Kamra produces aircraft and provides services that collectively put together are worth about 800 to $900 million a year. This includes all the JF-17, this includes all the Super Mashaks, this includes all the Mirage, Mirage rebuilds, the F-7 rebuilds, the engine rebuilds, name what you, what you may, the total value is close to about eight to 900,000 US dollars. This accounts to less than 0.1% of the global engineering uh, market out there. Open your horizons. Open your horizons. Many people in, this, in, this, in, in our Pakistani industry, when you say aircraft industry, they, they, they immediately conceive Kamra. Well, Kamra is a, is a very valuable national asset. But then again, in the global market, they are just that ministry. So that's what I'm trying to break. There is a big market out there uh, for the Pakistani high-tech industry enterprise to dig in. PAEC recommends the route this market is to seek to, be, to sell as a sub-sub-sub-vendor to some vendor who sells to the aircraft joints. That's the route we need to take. That is PAEC's narrative. We urge Pakistani high-tech industry to divest in the aerospace industry. You can do it. Most of you can do it. And carve Pakistan's share in this trillion dollar global aerospace engineering market. PAC will continue to pursue two strategic objectives. One is project its member, con member companies in the international and national dimension. And number two, get governmental recognition for the national high-tech aerospace industry. This is very, 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 very important. So that we are free to conceive products applications, business plans for the high value aerospace market without having to seek government permission and NOCs. By God, we are not looking for any concessions. We are not looking for any funding. All we want is set us free so that we can go into this market without asking, can we pass through this door or not? PAC will play its vital role in the promotion of these objectives with an export focused sustainable growth for its associated members. So in the end, I'll urge all the worthy members and um, all the audience right now to join me for a loud and passionate shout. Hum kisi se kam nahi. Khuda ki kasam, hum kisi se kam nahi. Sniya hamari mandi. We are in the double village and we'll go and dora deenge ghode is dasht o sehra mein, inshallah. Pakistan, Zindabad, Pakistan, Pahindabad. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you so much, Dr. Harun. And uh, without any further delay, I would request Dr. Ashad Ali to please join us and take the proceedings from here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Harun. Uh, Asif, you, uh, my video is stopped. Can you please uh, uh, turn it on? So, uh, so uh, Dr. Harun, I have known you over the past 25 years and have always been impressed uh, with your work. But today's uh, I have been real eye-opening. And uh, I must say you are real uh, jewel for Pakistan. Uh, and there are many such uh, real jewels uh, uh, we have in our uh, community. Yes. And uh, the purpose of Pakistan Aerospace Platform, as well as these webinar is uh, to let these jewels shine and people uh, notice uh, their potential. At the same time, the government or the agencies benefit from the indigenous intellect which exists around. At the same time, U.S. Ministry of Commerce has a slogan that for SME sector of USA, 95% of the market exists outside USA, uh, while the SME shall look only 5% of their business. And that is what uh, our businesses shall also think about. So uh, I would like to uh, invite Mr. Thomas Chang uh, who is part of uh, our uh, audience to share his comments, uh, uh, if there are any. Thomas, please. Hello. So if he is uh, uh, not available, then can I have comment from uh, AVM, uh, Air Marshal Ashfaq Arayn, please? Akshar, thank you very much for your kind words. I am humbled, and you're absolutely right. I am one of the very, very small. Uh, uh, so I'm one of the koalas in there. Or here, there are lots of shining heras out there, and we just need to recognize them and let them do their thing. Ashfaq Arain sahab, would you like to make any comment or we can go to Air Marshal Shahid Hamid. Uh, sir, can we have your comments, please? Well, Arshad, I know Harun, since long he mentioned about air weapons complex, I remember a young man coming to me. I'm, mashallah, very really impressed by the achievements that he's made. And I'm sure he's got a very good team now with you around. And knowing Rasgar, Amtiaz Rasgar Sahab, I tell you, he is a legendary figure. I've known him uh, since long. And I tell you, you guys are doing a wonderful job. We always thought there should be uh, an aerospace industry. Not really, I mean, as Arun said, go straight for the aircraft, but uh, aerospace industry in the private sector. As a sector. And we are also looking at now defense. You know, we are talking right now, discussing, as you very well know, we have this forum of aeronautical engineering. So we're talking to the government so that, you know, we could have this defense uh, industry with people like you, Harun, and everybody. They are there. I mean, I mean, very talented people. And we have our diaspora. You know, if you look at it, and you know it well, they have a lot of talent too. So I think Harun... Uh, this uh, lecture of his was an eye-opener. I have known him since very long. I know how he's been struggling. He did Sabari, I know very well. You know, we were, well, that time we were looking at UAV programs and so on and so forth. But all in all, I think it's a wonderful uh, session that we had. And thanks to uh, the, the Harun, the, the compare and yourself. And once again, I would congratulate all of you for doing such a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we are humbled. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, can we have comments from Dr. Sara Qureshi uh, or any question or anything? Dr. Sara. Yes, sir, can I please request you to please uh, stop your screen share so that we can see the participants? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I, 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 okay. 
Yep. There you go. Can you see me now? Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you, Sarah. Um, it was very informative and uh, I'm very happy to hear about your um, passion and your uh, commitment to Pakistan and to the aerospace sector. Or um, one of the things that was coming to my mind, that I ha as I had suggested earlier uh, for you, uh, to you uh, for the Aerospace Council was to uh, make a directory of uh, all the manufacturing capabilities around Pakistan that are available. Because this is a, a problem that we face that uh, whenever we want to get anything manufactured, um, you know, in machining or uh, foundry or whatever this it's just like word of mouth that we go through we try to find somebody we ask somebody there's no uh, specific um, database of available uh, you know skill set around the country in uh, you know the industry heavy areas such as uh, Salkot, Wazirabad and Faisalabad or and Gujrawala or somebody making motors or whatever so I think that's uh, that's something we does not require a very heavy um, technical expertise. Uh, maybe one of your, um, you know, as the council um, uh, managers or whatever can do this. There are some directories uh, available around with um, organizations who use vendors. So we can collect everybody on one platform and. Uh, if we take it to the next level, it could also be, um, you know, for uh, different startups who are making apps on different things. Maybe there could be an app on uh, the manufacturing facilities available around mm -hmm. Pakistan. And, you know, if somebody wants to get some R&D part developed, uh, uh, they could just, you know, send it through mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. app or through that platform mm -hmm. and get it. So this would, I think, help a lot of uh, research intensive uh, industries. And also, um, as uh, you know, I, well, this is something, my personal opinion, but we, we, we do try to, you know, we try to become child free also. So uh, whatever, instead of buying everything on the shelf, because what's happening right now that whatever we want to, when we are developing a product and we need uh, some capabilities, some manufacturing technique, and it's not available around Pakistan. And then we start making that thing and creating that facility uh, within our setup and start it from scratch, which is obviously it's a learning experience, but it's very time consuming. So that's one of my um, suggestions for the uh, council and uh, and something. And I think we need to focus on like small um, tangible um, projects, like small uh, products that uh, we can like, instead of having very long term, very big plans, like small uh, plans, uh, which are like uh, more real, like small projects that could be developed and um, basically that's what's coming to my mind the other thing is that uh, inshallah good to know about your uh, expertise with avionics and uh, we uh, we hope to uh, build an aircraft uh, in our company and we will contact you for uh, the avionics inshallah and uh, benefit from your expertise. Glad, to, glad to hear that glad to hear that Thank you. Thank you. And we are obviously uh, very happy to know about your, um, you know, passion for the country. Uh, thank you. Humble thank you. Thank you very much. We have noted your suggestions and uh, we will uh, make all possible efforts to uh, implement that. We have Sanveer, uh, who is a finance secretary for Pakistan Aerospace Council. Uh, can we have your comments uh, or any suggestion, please? Tanvir. Tanvir, sir. So if Tanvir, sir, uh, uh, 
is not there, then can we have Asif Jaz uh, uh, for your comments and suggestions? He uh, is the Vice President of Pakistan Aerospace Council. Asif Jaisal. Asif Saab is not available. So uh, then uh, uh, can we have, we have Zafar Saeed. Uh, he is also uh, one of uh, uh, old colleagues. Can we have your comments and suggestions, please? Zafar. Sure. I'm here. So good to see you after a long time. Let me adjust my screen. Uh, I think it's okay. So, uh, sir, uh, I was also passionate about development, but uh, uh, initially I thought that if there is no uh, financing for NRE and uh, financing for R&D, it's like chasing a wild goose, like you told so many. So then I went into trading and uh, with a little bit of... Uh, getting development from other companies abroad. I never knew, we never met basically, and I never knew we had such a strong potential available in our market. But uh, surely in future we need. And uh, the only thing is we need to conduct some uh, seminar from our, uh, our forum uh, for the customer uh, to have, uh, to define the specification very clearly. You know, most of the time, the definitions are not clear, especially in the job of R&D. The definitions are not clear, and there is then a lot of iteration process, like improve this one, because it was never defined before. So we should conduct, we should be having some education for the person who is buying thing or making you to make a thing. So we should conduct some seminars uh, at uh, some, some auditorium of your, our choice, wherever it is convenient for different industrial parts and the customer getting, especially the armed forces, army, air force, navy. And uh, it should be a open forum to discuss things with where, what are their requirements, how they can define them properly. So there is a purpose because for any establishment to fly, there should need to be a customer available to buy. So this is my suggestion that uh, there should be some seminars Joint Thank you very much. So we have two last comments. One is Masood Qureshi Kure Sahib has raised his hand and then we will have comments from Imtiaz Rafgar Sahib. So first Masood Qureshi Sahib, can we have your comments or any suggestions please? Masood Qureshi Sahib. Assalamualaikum. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, uh, Harun Qureshi Sahab because uh, that he has really uh, over, uh, overawed me uh, with his uh, with the accomplishments and his contributions. So uh, a lot of congratulations to him. And, uh, and inshallah, he will continue and uh, we have... Uh, my hopes in him have increased manifold. <clears throat> One of his points was uh, that you have nothing to do with the government. Now this is something uh, we can't quite take that uh, at faith value that we don't have any, we have to, have to, have to, have some um, consideration and some help and some assistance from the government. Part one. Part two is the government is very unstable. And what one government uh, encourages, the second government is hell bent to destroy it. So now, if we did it, I have an um, example, uh, a very, very close example of a railway uh, land that was leased out uh, to a golf club. Now, this land had cattle on it. It was supposed to be a golf club, but it had a had one swimming pool and a few sheds, and there were cattle. It was so this land was leased over to a 
uh, a golf club and there was a company from Malaysia who came in with the Pakistani investors and they had set up a, uh, a very high class international level golf club. This continued for, for some years. And suddenly in 2018, they canceled the, with whatever legal logic, I'm not getting into it, they canceled the deal. All that investment went to zero. They were paying a hell of a lot of rent to the railway in crores and crores. And now uh, the, this year, I don't know, the railway is subsidizing it. I'm sure in a couple of years, there will again be buffaloes tied over there. Hello? GG, we are uh, listening to you. Okay. So, I mean, this is what's going to happen. I mean, if I want to set up an aircraft factory and uh, if I... I mistake, take some, uh, uh, some land, uh, which, uh, whatever it is. I'm sure that in, in, in within two, within a decade, it will be taken over. It will be taken over, it will be taken over, and it will be destroyed. It's like a, a cow. Or, so, uh, uh, we would like to have yeah. comments from him. I understand that the government has to give a cow everybody so somebody would be given that cow to milk it and that's Absolutely. about the end of it and this is where i'm going to uh, stress that all those who are going to invest in this should be very very careful that do not enter into uh, a phenomena in which the government can take over i mean they of course in uh, in 1971 they were taken over uh, that's a separate story 1972 Thank you. Uh, but it Thank can you, happen sir. again yeah, thank yeah. you, sir. India Sam is actually a sufferer of that 71 uh, story. So we will have comments from him. Imtia Sab. I think the whole country suffers. Absolutely. Imtia Sab, you have mic on. Mic, please on. Thank you. Thank you. And I must congratulate uh, Dr. Harun. Uh, a lot of the story, I, uh, I've known him very intimately for a long time, like in the systematically, I never knew the technology story. Kya thi. We are really proud of what we have done. Mashallah. Like the other thing that you have said in the end, that the world is our world. Until you stay in Pakistan, this government's problem is that this is our world. We can't do it. But we have a track to our world. The world is our world. मेरी अपनी सारी जिंदगी इसी में ऐसे गुजरी है और इसके अंदर हमारे पास स्कोप है और जैसे आप लोगों ने देखा कि हमने सीबीआई में भी और उसके बाद भी वी हैव ट्राइड टू गो इनटू द वर्ल्ड मार्केट एंड सोम के एरोस्पेस इंडस्ट्री में भी बेशमार वो है सो आई थिंक द बेसिक थिंग इज दैट वी हैव ए प्लेटफॉर्म नाउ इन द शेप ऑफ पाकिस्तान एरोस्पेस काउंसिल uh, we have started uh, striving for doing certain things. Just uh, Dr. Tarak Rashi ne baat ki hai ke we need a directory of uh, resource people. So, jab humne Papam banai thi, we did that. So, Papam has now 450 companies and each one is a subject specialist. So, we will, as we go along, we are working hard so that our database banta chala jaye. Or, jo capabilities hai aur unki we can share uh, manufacturing, manufacturing, and design. So, uh, liye, I think we have made a good stride. Or, uh, thank you very much, Bakhtavar. Uh, you guys have, uh, Doc Saab, thank you very much. But, as we go along, <laughs> we, inshallah, we will continue. It's a nice and exciting sort of journey. Or, uh, through these uh, webinars, um, more and more people uh, in our membership, they will be exposed uh, and they will get um, known to the world also. Or uh, in the process, uh, yeah, this is also a networking. This is one way of networking. And I hope that this networking will continue. It will start to bear fruit also. So thank you very much. Thank you, um, uh, allow me to make a short comment here. Ye jo dunya hamari mandi, uh, nara laga hai. Ye to basically Rasgar sahab ka nara hai. Ye inhone aaj se 20 saal pehle azam di thi ke dunya hamari mandi. And my God, I believe in that and I sponsor that. Sir, ye hum sab ka naara hai ab ye. 
ان شاء الله Closing. Right, so in the end, I would like to thank all our guest speakers, our participants, and the people who have viewed our uh, whole webinar session. Uh, there is a small section of the feedback form that is available in the chat box. So if anyone has any sort of feedback, we would love to hear it from you. Uh, you can also follow us on our Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram pages for both EAEC and AIIA uh, to get the recording of today's webinar as well. In the last, I would also like to mention the AI training solutions for different levels that include the training for industry professionals, training for the fresh graduates and the customized trainings. So um, thank you all for your time and we hope to meet you next time and uh, stay tuned with us. Do like our Facebook and other uh, social media links so that you're updated with the kind of webinars we are going to arrange you for the next time. Thank you all. Stay safe and Allah. Thank you so very much. Allah.